This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome the show, Gail Chandler. How are you doing, Gail? Good. Good to be here. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, like we were talking about earlier, anytime I get an editor on, it's like a couple of salty dogs, like sailors talking about the olden battle days in the, in the edit yeah. room, which are always very entertaining. I'm sure you have some uh, amazing stories of what happens when the door closes in the edit room, which is always... And we'll talk a little bit about that, about the conversations that happen in there and with the producers and directors. But we really wanted to focus this episode on your new book, um, Editing for Directors, uh, and focusing on um, how directors should be working with editors. And it's something I've been trying to teach. Every time I, every time an editor walked into my suite, I tried to teach them how to work with me. Um, but before we jump in, how did you get into the business? Um, I was a projectionist in Northern California and I got into the IA and when they wouldn't let women in. And then I, it was a mixed local, which meant you could work on um, movies. And since it was Northern California, a lot of LA films came up here. And so I started doing location work as a grip and uh, lighting. And again, I was the only female and I was discouraged, but I did it. And and I was also um, then at uh, Sonoma State um, University taking um, communications courses. And I took a film history course thinking that was sort of frivolous, but the teacher was fabulous. Um, he ended up founding Tribeca and being the director there um, of the festival. And um, and I just really got, it, it sort of all it came together. I had been a box office cashier, then projectionist, and so in 79, I left for L.A. And um, and somebody said, you you probably editing would be the right bit for you. And it was. Yeah. Editing is uh, I, I fell into editing by not wanting to be a P.A. I said, hey, that sucks. I don't want to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. I'd rather sit in an air conditioned room all day and maybe get carpal tunnel. <laughs> Well, it was funny because one of the location guys said, why do you want to go to L.A. and sit in a dark room behind a moviola all day? And it was a good it was a, it was a big question, but it was obviously more than that. And when did you start? You actually started cutting on film. Yes. Sixteen and thirty five. And then I was working at Alan Landsberg Productions mm -hmm. um, as an assistant editor on um, sixteen and. We would, what I had what we called the sinky pool. We just would sink the dailies, and then eventually you could be assisting an editor. And they went video, three quarter inch, oh. and we were onlining on two inch, and plot. <laughs> and um, it, it, at any rate, it, it, this, these technical terms, you know, it, there were two processes then, and it's, it's very interesting that online has gone away. And but you know what eventually, of course, happened was that. It was the film people were doing features, the video people were doing TV, which was what I was in. And they all came together with the digital uh, evolution mm -hmm. in the early 90s. And everybody finally uh, was on, the, were on the same systems and, and the systems could talk to film and video. And that's what's evolved from there. But basically, it was a huge revolution. And I, I was lucky that I got in fairly early. Uh, when I got in, I was I was taught the opposite way. I was taught nonlinear editing first, then online editing, then film. So by the time I got to film on a flatbed, I was like, you mean to tell me you want me to take a razor blade, cut this, and tape it? What are we, the Flintstones? What is this barbarian? It was completely beyond me because they had already taught me a computer, which was so much quicker. And online even was <laughs> online, you know, working on a CMX 3600 or a Grass Valley or a Sony, a Sony editing system. Uh, all those were so much faster. Um, but I, I did get to cut the, uh, what was it? That uh, episode of Gunsmoke, is it? Is the episode of Gunsmoke? That oh, they, yeah. I, everyone, I everyone, that. everyone cut on that, right? That's the, that's the one thing everyone right. cut on. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, um, I know we're, my book is about is for directors and there may be some directors that all of this online and splicers and all of that yeah, is yeah, like yeah. it it it's before 
your time and why should you be interested in really um, what I want to say, the takeaway to people that are young, that are directing and editing from all this is that is, is the word change. Um, because I personally train hundreds of professionals and students on digital editing equipment. And um, the students, you know, they kind of came of age with the computer, but the editors and assistants did not. And, and change is going to happen in your career. And it was very interesting witnessing how people reacted to it. Mm -hmm. Some people were um, filmed forever and I can't cut unless I can feel it in my hands. And that may sound crazy to somebody who's never been on film, doesn't want to be on it, will never have to be on it. But the point here is change. You really edit and you direct. Well, let's just talk editing. You, you edit with your heart and your head. And whatever medium comes down the pipe next, um, you're going to jump to that. Um, whatever new technology with cameras and all that, it, it, as Lucas said, you know, art is 50 percent technology. Um, and, you know, oil painting change things, watercolors, you know, Charcoal, and all just that, yeah. these technical evolutions that Alex and I have been talking about, um, you know, are, are um, stuff that we happen to live through. You will be living through different ones and just and just know you're going to have to learn new software and new words and new terms. Oh, yeah. I mean, right now we're talking about things like, you know, you know, people are editing, editing on Final Cut and DaVinci and, and Premiere and those kind of editing softwares. And we're still calling it, you know, we're still looking at it from a, uh, a screen perspective, meaning that it's a two dimensional scene, a screen. I, in our lifetime, or, uh, you know, there's very good possibility that there could be an editing of a holodeck scene you know and it's all holograms and there's going to be editing systems to edit that's it there's going to be things that are, are beyond our comprehension now that uh, this generation who's young now like oh we came up with the avid or we came up with final cut and now they're like well now have you used the holodeck system that's insane <laughs> it's going to change yeah. it's going to change yeah and the tools are something you want to learn and see what they can do and right. see what you can do with them um, but the principles of how you tell a story and reach an audience are um, always there. And, and they're evolving, too. No, without question. So in your opinion, what is the most misunderstood part of the editing process from a director and producer's point of view? I think people think editors just make cuts. <laughs> it's sort of like thinking a dressmaker just makes stitches. You know, you're making a whole costume. Or, you know, in the terms of editing, you really are the person that is telling the story in the end. Whatever you conceived in the script or the documentary outline or whatever you shot on location for the, the documentary or the scripted piece. Um, even, you know, I, I work primarily in sitcoms. Um, stuff would still change in the editing room. And that's where you have to make performances work and locations work and as you know you were a you're a colorist alex or you have been and you have to balance the color and make make the looks work and i think the tools today you know allow you to do so much more but anyway to to get back to the question i think the conception i think the real takeaway is that the editor is the is a storyteller as much as um, the person who wrote the story and scripted it. Yeah, and, and it's funny because actors really should give bonuses to the editor uh, at the end of a film because it's them who cut together their performance. I've, I've been in the edit room where I've had to cut a performance and you're cutting the best of the best and like literally shaping someone's performance and saving them sometimes like when they're their performance is not that good. Maybe you cut away to something else and then come back or cut to reaction. All in the in the, in the service of the movie, but also in the service of the performance. And without the editor, you know, it's just a bunch of takes. And some takes are good, some takes aren't. So you got a bad editor involved. They could choose the wrong takes and make that performance horrible. And and I'm sure you know, looking through all that old looking through footage, you there's a lot of stuff that you have to kind of cut through to just find that that one second, that one frame that makes that scene work. 
Yeah, and 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 that's what my, why my book, um, the publisher actually, Michael Weasley, came up with the idea mm -hmm. um, to really help directors because they may be, you know, you, you've gone through as a director, you've gone through maybe months, maybe years um, of pre-production and planning, and then you've finally gotten to film your baby, and now you're trusting it to this person who you may know or may not know. And are they going to get your film the way you want it and, and make it work in areas that you may have pro know are problematic? Um, so as a director, you know that where you're finishing is editing. And so you really want to think about that from the beginning. I, I talk a lot about how, you know, I talk about how you pick an editor, how you, you know, how you, you want to develop trust and. How that. do you, how do you pick an editor? How, how is it? What's a, what's some good points for a director to pick an editor to collaborate with? I mean, I think, I think you talk to people, you know, you obviously interview people, you, you know, look at their resume, you look at what they've done. And I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a short term marriage or a good affair. <laughs> I always like to say, um, you know, you want somebody that um, will get your intent as a director. You want to look for that in a person and you, but you also want somebody um, that hopefully you will develop, develop a relationship where you can hear their feedback and hear from them. This isn't working or, I, ha I mean, directors love to be problem solvers. They love to fix performances. I mean, I've been kissed in editing rooms because, you know, by directors because they were like, oh, my God, I was so worried about this scene. And we hadn't talked about it. Um, and, you know, and, and you love it when you can make something work. And, and you, you know, the, the, the other thing I wanted to say was the, the editor is really receiving your raw material. No matter, it's really it's a blueprint until it gets turned into something in the editing room. Um, and it's what the audience is going to see. They don't care if you spent 10 days working in the snow, you know, sludging through tunnels to get a shot. If the shot doesn't advance the story or say what your film is about or do something, it's not just a gorgeous shot or, you know, or a hard, a hard earned shot. The editor is very objective. The editor is, you know, detached from the set most of the time. And a lot of editors like to go to the set. A lot of us don't because we want to keep that objective eye. And so I would say all of that is what you're looking for in an editor. Now, how does a director shoot for the cut? How an, a, a, an editor, I mean, I a, mean director, a director. Yeah. How a director would shoot for the cut is, um, a major thing would be to think about sound. People don't think about sound. Hmm. And, um, you know, poor sound can harm you more than poor picture, really. People oh. if they can't understand stuff. Um, you know, go and listen to locations. Think about how you want your movie to sound. Um, the other things are, you know, work on screen direction. Don't cross the line. Or if you do cross the line, understand what it is and why you're crossing it. Um Maintain eye lines. Um, if Alex is looking down while I'm talking or looking at the ceiling, the audience might think he's bored with me or doesn't like me or is disinterested. Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking right eye to eye, you know, we're connecting. Um, we may be fighting, we may be whatever. But, um, you know, eye lines are very important to maintain when you're doing drama. That's an, another thing that you need to think about. Um, yeah, I mean, and also just those, I think the biggest piece of advice I always give young directors is cutaways. Just shoot cutaways. For God's sake, shoot cutaways. Just shoot like uh, um, Robert Rodriguez with El Mariachi. Uh, he just shoot the dog. And anytime he got in trouble, he just cut to the dog or he cut to a turtle or he cut to a vase or, you know, obviously if you can shoot cutaways that mean something even better, but just safety, shoot cutaway, a hand, hands moving, you know, reactions, hair flipping. Those little things are what we love as editors because then you can really sculpt a scene because if you've got to stay with that performance and you have nowhere to go... <laughs> I'm sure you've run into that wall. You're just like, oh, God, I need just something to cut away to. 
thank you for bringing that up. That's another major um, thing that you want to think about as a director when you're shooting. Um, you know, coverage, if you have a scene that's not working and you don't have anywhere to go, then you're stuck with a boring bit in a scene unless you can cut away to something. Um, and, you know, cutaways can be really interesting. You know, a treasure map. People want to see mm -hmm. what what everybody's talking about. A close-up of that, you know, and I always say a close-up of Meryl Streep's face is worth a thousand lines of dialogue. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, film is a very, you know, faces say a lot. Um, but get those close-ups, get, get those over the shoulders, get different angles and shots because it gives you more options in the cutting room. Yeah, I was in the cutting room once and uh, we had the scene that there was just long and it was like a, a, an emotional breakdown, but it was just so long and it was, we liked this cut. Liked the, we wanted to cut two takes together and we couldn't because like, oh my God, we didn't shoot any cutaways. And the camera was in the room of the edit room and the dog of the director was in the room. So we just put the dog on the couch. I threw a light up. I lit it. She shot it with the camera. That was the same camera she shot the movie with. Uh, and then we literally just took the card out, inserted it. And I'm like, okay, we're good now. <laughs> Can you imagine that in the early days? <laughs> well, it, I, I was on a, a show where um, a little boy goes to a construction site with his friends and they're playing around and they they somehow get one of the big machines going and it's going downhill and you know it's very exciting and upsetting and all that and of course he lives and he's fine um but what and they shot like 15 angles and this was a half hour sitcom so this was a big scene and it was very unusual in a single camera so it was unusual to get that many angles and what they didn't shoot was the boy they didn't shoot a close-up of the boy oh. and the editor just said you, you we need this we got to have this and i was very lucky to work with a very famous editor who actually couldn't understand the system so i ended up having, having to operate it for him and anticipate where he was going to go in this scene and many other scenes so it really advanced my editing um but at any rate the director said i can't do that we're off the location we're back you know, on the studio. And um, he's the direct, the editor said, put him in a chair. So they literally took, you know, a, a set chair and put the kid in and raised him up and, and shot him. And it made all the difference in the scene. Yeah. It's, 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 it's pretty remarkable what you, uh, you can get away with <laughs> in today's world. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, cueing your, your characters and people's reactions is cueing your audience on how to feel. It's really important. Yeah. I mean, I mean, something as simple as a glass being put on the, on the table, things like that, those little things that when you're in the heat of battle, it's hard to think about. And that's something as directors, we're in the middle of, you know, a thousand things are coming at us and we're like, okay, everyone stop. I need a shot of the glass. And like, that's a hard, like you gotta be, <laughs> as a director, you gotta yeah. be comfortable with yourself. Like we're getting into OT or we're about to hit lunch. I'm like, guys, I need the glass hitting the table. And at the moment people are like, this this prima donna, like, but it that one little move saves the scene. You know? Well, and, 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 you know, that the B roll is, is just as important. Mm -hmm. um, David Watkins, famous cinematographer who got the Academy award for out of Africa in his, and I put this in the book actually, um, cause it always stuck with me and it never fit in any other book that I wrote, but this one it did because he, he was so complimented on out of Africa because the shots of the animals and, you know, they did stuff from clearly from helicopters. They didn't have drones in those days. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're gorgeous. And so people would come up to him and say, Oh, you, you know, you did such a great job. And he said, that was second unit. That was B roll. And then they'd come, Oh, you know, he shot the principals. He shot Redford and street, you know? And, um, so, and you think of Out of Africa without those shots, and um, it's a different movie. No, absolutely. I um, I love that example that Hitchcock. Uh, I saw I saw a, a, a you know a documentary with him once about the editing process, and he's like, "This is how powerful editing is." He goes, "Let's say I shoot a shot of me, then the next shot we shoot show is a baby playing, 
and then you see cut back to me smiling now the emotion that you that that, that the audience gets is like oh isn't that cute now all you do is replace the center shot instead of a baby a beautiful woman in a bikini a young woman in a bikini same thing all of a sudden oh what a creep that is the power of editing and that's something directors really need to understand if you really I mean you should absolutely if you're a director study hitchcock i mean it's, it's mass, every one of his films there's a master class in editing but it's so so powerful a cut a shot an angle um can change the entire perception of the scene do you agree yes and have you heard of the cool shop effect the which one? Oh, um i yes yes from uh Oh God! Uh, so, yeah, from Rus- yeah. From the Russian, from the the one that's the yeah. famous picture of the guy going crazy holding yeah. the, fr- the, the frame. Yes, right. and Hitchcock didn't come up with it. It was him, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I did in this book is it's very practical. You know, from pre-planning and direct and editing is editors are being brought in more with pre-planning, especially pre-pro with previs with I- animation editors. Um, I, I really cover um, the, what a director needs to think about from you know pre-production through archiving. You want your film to last. Um, you want to think about archiving and more. Rev- you know how can you reach future audiences? How can you create revenue streams? Um, even though you know you're just lucky if you're doing a doc, low budget or anything low budget. Um, you know you're just thinking about getting the movie made, not alone archiving. But I go through that. But at any rate, one of the chapters that is one of the chapters I love the most um, it, and the longest is um, the others I broke up a little more um, is on uh, the history of editing. And um, I, I put that in there because I want people to understand that editing really is the language of the fi- of film mm-hmm. and editing. You really like no other art. You see how people think and how they feel from second to second in a flash cut of three frames or a long dissolve. It, you play with time, you play with people's emotions the way no other medium I think really does. And so part of that chapter, I, I talk about the Russians and their, they had their revolution. And so all the filmmakers were tasked with, you know, teaching the proletariat, what was, what the rules of communism. Uh, um, so, uh, they started the first film school in Moscow, which still goes on to t- today. And they did; they had short ends. They they didn't have film, so they they didn't couldn't do long masters like Americans could. And they chopped up a, Citizen Kane. They chopped up a lot of. They looked at a lot, or not Citizen Kane it hadn't been shot then, but they looked at a lot of American films. And um, one of them, um, Kulshoff, I forget his first name. They had some leftover footage from a white Russian actor who was very well known and he had left the country with the revolution and so they took um a frame a few uh, some frames of him and intercut them with um a young girl picking a flower and -hmm. people thought he was um smiling then they cut to him again and they um well first they cut to the girl then they cut to him people thought he was smiling then they cut to a woman in a coffin, a young child in a coffin. They, then they cut to him. People thought he was sad. Then they cut to a woman on a chaise lounge and they thought he was amorous. And it was the same shot each time. And so the whole, this relates to what you said about Hitchcock and the smiling and the creepiness. It, you know, is the, in the Russian theory, but you can use whatever word you want. It, it, they juxtapose shots. Shots affect each other. And people take meaning out of shots that were shot at different times, different days, different places, etc. Humans just, our brains want to do that. And it's so funny because sometimes I'll see a movie because um, there's so much content being created today. I'll watch a movie that's, you know, off off brand. Let's say it's not a big movie, you know, it's an independent or, or something along those lines. And... and or it has a star in it, and 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 I watch it, and and then a dir- the director and the editor make a mistake, and you see like oh they cut to that, and like that's not the meaning. Like wait a minute, that feels weird. That person shouldn't be feeling the way they are, and it's and it's obviously a mistake. It's not like you know the woman shouldn't be feeling 
you know, jilted. She should be fielding something else. And it was a look. It's a, it was an energy. And because it was the way it was juxtaposed to what they were cutting, it just feel, it just, you just get taken out of the, of the, of the piece. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful stuff. And, and Hitchcock again talked about it so, so, so much where he wanted to like literally play the audience's emotions on a piano uh, eventually to get to that point, which he pretty closely did uh, with his editing. But uh, it's pretty powerful. And, and, and to go down the Hitchcock rabbit hole just for a minute, arguably one of the greatest, uh, most talked about scene, edited scenes ever is the, is the shower scene. They did a whole documentary just on the shower scene. Um, as an editor looking at that, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? So, so directors listening can understand that they've never seen it or they've heard about it, maybe they watched it what value it would be to go back to what he did and what the editor did in that, that what is it? Uh, I forgot how many frames it is, but how many seconds, 48 seconds or 56 seconds or whatever it is, how powerful that was. Yeah, I, I've read a lot of Hitchcock and I admire him in a lot of ways too. And I highly recommend um, uh, Truffaut on yes. Hitchcock. Yes, what a great book um, and movie. It, you know, as a director, you know, Truffaut, the French loved Hitchcock and Truffaut interviewed him and they went through every movie and Truffaut really um, asked him a lot of questions. And it's really, you know, and I do quote from Hitchcock in the book, you know, about the birds and 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 part of conce- how he conceived the birds musically and and, oh, yeah. and and their thoughts and now they're this and now they're that um but the shower scene i i honestly forget now how many cuts and how short it is but you know it it was flash cuts and and you you saw a woman being chopped up and attacked and it it was you know we it's stuck with everybody who's ever seen it and it still works and oh, um, the music, it's the, the music, the music mix and the cuts. intercutting. And he always got Bernard Herrmann um, to to compose his film. And I mean, Vertigo, I talk about Vertigo in the book. Actually, I d- didn't get into Psycho so much. But in Vertigo, he has very he has like um, carousel music. Everything's mm-hmm. twirling. Mm-hmm. And the beginning of Vertigo, I put in the sh- shots, their mandalas coming out of people's eyes. So everything is very circular. And it supports his, you know, the, the idea of vertigo. Um, the, yeah, the shower the, scene is worth seeing, you know, uh, Buster Keaton's um, train chase in oh, yes. The Little General mm-hmm. is incredible. And, um, you know, but there are a lot of fantastic oh, actors. Yeah. I mean, I mean, The Fugitive, I remember with Harrison Ford, you know, we, the Editor's Guild, that, we screened that, that, they had a screening in the 80s and, and people just, this was an Indian industry audience, and people just stood up and clapped. Right. If you can break through the industry audience, you know you've got something. Yo, I remember watching The Fugitive as well. It's it's remarkable. Then you go. Um, by the way, the, just uh, just to finish off on Hitchcock, that shower scene. What's so brilliant about it for me is, you never see the knife go in. You yeah. never see the knife touch her skin ever because it wasn't allowed. At the time, I think, or something. Hitchcock always got around the the, the 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 censors, but that's the brilliant part. But your mind connected it all because of the cuts and the music. That you were like, this woman is. You just said this woman was getting chopped up. She really was. <laughs> there's no, there's right. no, there's no right. graphic hit of it. Yes, there's blood, there's flashes, there's this and that, the eyes and the motion, but there's no actual, you know, skin knife penetration in the scene, which is that's the brilliant part about. One of the many brilliant parts about that sequence. Um, but the one thing you were saying about action sequences is now I think sometimes it, you go the other direction. Like there was a scene in, I think, Taken 2 or Taken 3, one of those that had Liam Neeson running. And you know, Liam is not 21, and he's running and he's jumping a fence. They counted how many cuts. Just from him jumping a fence was like 15 cuts. Mm. And you're like you're basically cutting, making you're forcing the action by the edit. The edit is kind of keeping pace because to actually see a 60 year old man jump a fence, not that exciting. But with the music and the cut, but it was just so much. You just like that, 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 that. You don't let anything sit. And sometimes the most powerful cut is not cutting. Is that fair? Yes, 
And sometimes the most powerful cut is silent. Like after you've had a big action scene, it's, it's like music. You can have staccato and go cut, cut, cut. And then, you, you know, it, let's just, the obvious, war is a very obvious example after the battle. And then you just need, you know, the dead people on the battlefield or people collecting themselves, the audience to collect themselves. Um, it's, it, editing is very rhythmic. And I think, you know, you and your editor as a director, you, you want to pick somebody that, that's going to go on the journey with you because you may have directed a lot of pictures or you may be new, but each thing you do is, you know, is going to be new, even if it's part of a series or it's a routine show, you're going to bring what you bring to it, your eyes and your talent. And you just, in, in editing, that continues. The the one thing I've always had a problem with with younger directors or just inexperienced directors is when they walk in the suite, they really truly don't understand the responsibilities of an editor. And a lot of times, you know, I always I always I I go there there's two camps of editors. There's creative editors who have I've dealt with, and there's online editors, and not online in the traditional sense, but the online is in like putting in the final visual effects, cleaning things up tightening up technically, getting ready for the export, that stuff. Because a lot of creative directors I've worked with are clueless when it comes to any of that stuff. They're there just for the creative. And if you go, can you insert a VFX? Like, I need an assistant for that. I can't. That's not what I do. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the responsibility of an editor is uh, traditionally and what so many editors are nowadays? Like myself, when someone would come in to, and I would edit a feature – I would edit the feature, I would put in the visual effects, I would temp visual effects, I would do a color grade, I would prep it for final, I would prep it for sound. I became a post supervisor at that point. Essentially, I was doing everything. I was doing creative and I was doing online. So there are those kind of hybrid versions, but traditionally, what are the responsibilities of a creative editor, let's say? I think traditionally, the responsibility is, as I've mentioned, to tell the story and to see what characters work, what characters po possibly need to be dropped or cut down or shifted, what scenes need to be shifted. How, you know, how, how does the, the conception hold up in the editing room? And, and a lot of directors feel for the first cut that they need to represent you, the director's vision. They, they, you know, you need to see it the way you thought it was going to work. And then the two of you can go together and, tinker with that or drastically change it or do whatever you're going to do. Um, you know, when, when editing started um, in modern times, let's say the fifties, you were editing on film and you had one or two tracks and one picture. Right. Now with, with the system, you know, Alex and other people that editor work, that editors work on, there are an infinite amount of tracks. You can have tracks within tracks within tracks and not just, um, audio tracks, but video tracks. So you can do, you know, very simple effects, fades and dissolves, and you can do green screen. You can do very complex video effects. Now those, the really complex ones, you're probably not going to do on the system because they're going to take up too many system resources right. and you're going to yeah. drop them in. And, you know, on a big video effects show, you're going to have a video effects editor and a whole department and, um, you know, probably a post house of some kind behind right. you. So, you know, in answer to your question, the editor can be simply the, you know, the storyteller making things work, or they can be, you know, they can be doing everything like you did, Alex. They can be doing the, all the effects. They can be doing the video, you know, all the sound. They can mix right on the system. Um, you can put in scratch track right on the system, um, which is, really handy when you're working along and seeing if things are working and maybe you have to add a, a VO that you didn't anticipate or you have one and you want to see how it lays up against your picture. So there's no real answer to that any, anymore. anymore. Before it would be yeah, just the one thing. It, it just depends on your budget and, you know, is it a commercial? Is it a feature? Is it a doc? Is it a, you know, but, commercial? But, whatever. but I do think that the director should be very clear with the editor and what their capabilities are because they might walk in thinking that they can online the whole thing and they're like, I really can't. And the editor should be honest too, like, 
I'm a creative editor. I maybe be able to get you a little bit closer to the to the finish line, but I can't do everything that you need me to do. So yes. that, that both parties really need to be clear about that, which is something early on that that wasn't even a question. It was the editor just cut, and then someone else, the online editor, would take over and and take it. There was there was more division of duties where now it's just all everybody, even the director, like myself. I direct and I edit. So I come in and I'll do my own post and I'll do my own color and I'll do my own everything. Yeah, I mean, you you know where you're starting and, and that's why, you know, I wrote this book. You you want to know where you're finishing, who's doing mm -hmm. what and right. um, yes. Now, can you talk a little bit about what the assemble cut is? Uh, because the, the difference between an assemble cut and my definition, at least maybe yours is different, but the assemble cut then there's the 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 first draft the first cut basically the first draft cut then the final cut and then that's it um but the assemble cut my definition of the assemble cut is always like you literally look at the script and whatever scene is there you just cut it together and you put it all there regardless if it works or not is that an assemble cut in your definition as well not you know to me a first cut is where you're putting everything together as okay. scripted as outlined um an assembly to me is more you're sort of putting the shots together within a scene mm -hmm. and um it you know it, it all depends on whether you're fine cutting or rough cutting i mean a, a lot of people like to uh, some editors work by you know they sort of get things going and get things in order and then they go back and fine tune it and to me that would be more of an assembly you sort of know the shots you're going to use and you put them together um others of us and uh i, I fine cut from the beginning i cannot i know me neither i can't <laughs> tighten up i i want my timing from the beginning <laughs> because you know you will you will find you know if you're a director and you're sitting with an editor cut and you're working together that you your mind is always going five shots ahead and and sort of a little behind of where did I come from and where am I going? And well, if we go here, then this is going to be, we're going to have to do this. And if we, you know, you know, it, it's very intense. It's very, it, you know, it really uses, you come out and you're kind of exhausted. No, um, it, probably if you haven't been editing for a while. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very intense, you know, see what works. And then, um, and then it is like, like music, you want to drop back. You want to go away for an hour or a day or a night, an evening, and then come back and see, you know, where, was that thing we got really high on yesterday, that really, was that like the greatest thing we ever did or does that hold up overnight? Um, it's a lot, it, it, you want, you want it in editing, you, you may, there may be a lot of trial and error and, right. and, um, and, and that's just the nature of the game. I think that I want to kind of touch on something you just said is the because sometimes in the edit room, you, you are in this delusion, uh, this 12th hour. Oh, my God, we just cut the greatest scene of all time. And then you go home, you sleep on it, you come in, you watch and like, yeah, that doesn't work. What happened? You really need to give yourself that pace. And, and not only with a scene or a cut, but with the film, um, you need to go away from it for a while, because once you're in it for so long, you lose perspective and sometimes you do need to just put it you know turn off the computer for a week walk away do something else then come back to it's kind of like writers writers who are writing and writing and writing at a certain point they just got to stop when they're done put it away for a few weeks come back and reread it to see if it's truly the genius that they thought it was in the first place yeah and you know it, it, it's a great analogy because you know when I, i've done a lot of script writing also and um, you know, when you write, you want to get the, the script the best that you can. And then, and it's the same as editing, you want to get the cut as be best you can. And then at a certain point, you, you need feedback. I mean, you are creating this for an audience. And so you need to get um, people, you know, a loyal focus group of some kind to come in and, and say, I don't get this main character or I don't like that scene or that's really hard. And, and then you, then you decide what you're going to do from there. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, now, can we talk about um, the holy place that is the final cut or locked cut? 
the I call it holy. It, it, it's sacred because as an editor, when the cut is locked, many directors and producers think that's fluid. No, it's locked. If it's locked, that means that audio is working on it. Visual effects are working on it. Um, score is working on it. If you change a frame, the whole thing comes crashing down. Can you just talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I totally get your point. When you lock a cut, it means you're not going to change another picture frame. And so that it will not get shorter by a frame. It will not get longer by a frame. It will stay exactly the same length. And this is incredibly critical for the the sound editors. Um, because oh. if you, you know, on a feature, you're going to have, you know, Foley, you're going to have effects, and then you're going to have dialogue editors, and they are all dependent on this cut. And if you change it by one frame, their timing and your sound is off. The music doesn't start right. The, you know, and the, so the, and the same goes for music. So um, they do what's called conform to the to the latest the the, the locked cut, um, and that's what you mix to. You don't want to be having the bombs fall and you taken out half a scene and oops. You or know, f- or and, frame or frame one frame will knock the entire thing out of whack. So it's not efficient of the studio's time or money, and your job is going to be on the line if you if you um, unlock the cut and you know past a, a you know past time when when people are really mixing. Having said that, uh, sound editors call it becomes uh, it, it becomes unlocked or it slips a little, um, <laughs> and you kind of can get away with certain things and everyone knows it like if there was a cut between alex and me and let's say it was a dissolve and it was um 10 frames long but let's say we want to wait it so we see more of alex now instead of me there's still going to be 10 frames but we're going to yeah you can slip you can slip a little but again you know if you've got something that has very precise timing and you've got all these people that you're paying, you're going to be paying them more and it is going to take longer. If you are frame, uh, I don't want to use the word. <laughs> no, I, I know the word you're, I knew exactly the word you're going to say. Frame effing. Frame effing. That's my drift here, folks. <laughs> yeah. frame yes. To the, to the last minute. Um, and, you know, the truth is with today's digital editing systems, mm-hmm. um, people change stuff after they've been on air. Lucas went back and changed all of Star Wars and recolored them and and redid some of the effects. So nothing really is fixed anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm being honest here. I mean, in terms of getting your movie made and staying employed, you want to stick with the lock cut and hit the deadline and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and all that. But the truth is, stuff you know people do go back into shows and if it's your movie you can do what you want till the cows come home if you're paying the bills but just know that it's gonna it's gonna cost you time and money and and you may lose some people along the way because they get other jobs or they get too frustrated Mm -hmm. the frustration is a very good word to use um (laughs) and since you were up north in northern california um, you must have heard the, of the lore of Star Wars, the first Star Wars, and you brought George up, um, that the first cut of Star Wars was an absolute dismal mess, and it was horrible, And uh, because I think the studio stuck him with an editor that he didn't want, and the first cut looked horrible. And then he had to go in with his wife, and I forgot who the, the Academy Award uh, editor was. Paul Hirsch. Thank you. Went in, and someone, there was two, wasn't there was two? There was... Uh, it was, there was Marsha, Lucas, and Paul, and I honestly forget the third end. But there was right but now. there was another one, and then everybody went back in and and made it into what we are today. But it was completely – it was destroyed and then saved in the cut. Same footage. Same footage, but just put together differently. And that's the power. And look what <laughs> look what the power of the editor did for, for that film and <laughs> all the things that have come afterwards. Yeah, I mean, Paul Hirsch actually wrote a book about his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw saw that one recently, yeah. Yeah, and I actually put it in the book. So I do talk about uh, the Star Wars and 
and how they introduce Luke at a, uh, at a different point and how they cut stuff down and, and, and just how exa exactly how they crafted it and um, rearranged the scene with Obi-Wan Kenobi and um, Princess Leia and, and Luke, where Luke says, no, I can't help you and leaves. And he appeared callous in the first cut and they just rearranged things. And so that's in the book actually too. Um, to analyze so, a little, yeah. to analyze something like that, because that's a great learning tool of like, you know, Luke, if you cut them at the wrong time, he looks callous. The other time he looks heroic. It's editing is powerful stuff, guys. It's extremely powerful stuff is is a weapon uh, in, in the creative battle that can be wielded. Uh, and you got to be very careful with it. <laughs> yeah, And just, you know, just know that the great Lucas, you know, made mistakes. I mean, everybody, yeah, all of us do. You know, all the greats have made, done all kinds of stuff and 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 you're gonna learn and and do your great make your great imprint and the faster you the faster you make these mistakes the faster you learn so you have to make as many mistakes as fast as possible and continue making them throughout your career because everyone does that. there's very few directors who have a perfect filmography very few if any that have an absolute perfect you know some art is art it's hard to hit the home run and what is a home run what's the definition of a home run in in art you know yeah. um now i want to ask you a few questions i ask all my guests um i normally ask what's your three of your favorite films of all time but i'd love to ask you what are three of the best edited films of all time in your opinion that the editing really took a kind of a front seat well raging bull is is <laughs> one that come to a, a lot of people's mind um, and to be honest, before I wrote this book, I never paid attention. Just the violent nature of the relationship and oh, I, and the woman being brutalized when it came out in the eighties, I, I wanted no part of the film, mm -hmm. but in writing the history chapter, I actually end up, ended up reading and writing a lot about, um, and researching a lot about the film. And I think, um, the, there is an example of uh, Th Thelma Schoonmaker and Marty Scorsese, Scorsese, you know, an editor director pair that have, you know, that are bonded for life and that have done incredible stuff since Woodstock when he was an assistant director and she mm -hmm. won the Academy Award for um, uh, a documentary, which is really unusual for best film. Any, anyway, um, so I would definitely say Raging Bull because it just takes things to a different level and it was planned a, a lot of those slow-mo shots and the sweat flying across i mean it's and and I, I would not only look at it um i would read about it because that will help your directing and your thinking about editing Very so cool. that's that's definitely one mm -hmm. um, and any other couple that you could think of or or just two of your other favorite films that you just love watching um you know, there was a, a a movie that came out in the '70s when I was a projection. It was it was called From Noon Till Three, and it was Jill Ireland and Charles. Um, uh, what was the action star? Her husband, Charles uh, uh, Charles Bronson. Yeah, Charles Bronson, and I would like to see it again because you just don't know how things hold up. Um, it it was basically the story in that that. Um, He's he's um, comes into town and um, they have a, a noon to three. They have a romance and then he's arrested and goes to prison. And she's like a stereotypical, like a school mom or something. So this was like the greatest, you know, one of the, the, the big thing that happened in her life. So the whole town becomes about this robbery and they recreate him and her and all of them. And you know, they romanticize the romance. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back from prison and he wasn't really a robber. He was a snake oil salesman, I think, that got caught up. And she sees him and it's just like, there's nothing there. It, it, it's like she has gone into the fantasy. So I guess it wasn't the editing in that one so much as just the story. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, my other favorite film is, is Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Oh, nice. The original. And I think that I realized is it's because it's the whole teacher-student relationship. 
mm-hmm. and that we all have teachers in our lives that eventually we outgrow. And, and, and I've watched that film since I was in my 20s and my views of it have really changed. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I don't know, those, the one really spoke more to editing and is famous for it, but the other two are just some of my, you know, films that meant something. Hey, that's a good answer. And, and where can people find uh, your books and, and, and the work that you do? Um, my books are all on Amazon. You can just put my name in, G-A-E-L, and um, Chandler. And um, they're also available for my ever-loving film publisher, MichaelWeezyProductions.com. Mm-hmm. Very good. Gail, thank you so much for being on the show. I, it was it was fun talking shop with another editor, and I, I appreciate uh, all the work you're doing and helping educate uh, directors and editors uh, around the world. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.